Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to our town board meeting of Tuesday, January 24th, 2023. Can I please have a motion to open the town board meeting? I move to open the town board meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, before we get started with the reason I know most of you are here, we have uh, just some preliminary items. Um, announcements. Are there any announcements? You guys? Yes. I do have one announcement. I'd just like to remind everybody that Tuesday, January 31st, is the last day to pay the second half school taxes without penalty. So I just encourage you, if you are responsible to pay your taxes as opposed to your bank, please be sure to either come in or drop off your payment before then. Um, if you choose to mail it, be sure you witness a U.S. post mark being affixed to it. Don't simply drop it at a post office or in a mailbox. The penalty is 10%. So 10% if you're one day late and really it's so upsetting to see people come in and have to take, accept that. Um, so please come in and pay your taxes. We'll be here from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And you can submit a post-dated check if you would like to as well. Absolutely. You can post-date your check for whatever date you like, and we hold it until that date, and so it's possible before that. So please. Thank you. Uh, thank you. In terms of a supervisor's report, uh, most of it will be in the newsletter tomorrow. Just a couple things. First, I want to wish a happy Lunar New Year to all who celebrate. Um, and also, uh, this weekend, we are having um, the Town of Newcastle's Committee on Race, Equity, and Inclusion uh, is partnering with the um, PTA and their Diversity, Race, uh, and Belonging Committee, the Library, and the Horace Greeley BIPOC Student Union uh, for an I Have a Dream celebration, and, um, which is a day of celebration with um, a peace walk. Um, as well as followed by a panel discussion. So that's on the 29th. There'll be information in the supervisor's report and, and on Facebook. So we would love to see all of you there uh, in attendance. Um, and then in early February, we're having our uh, Lunar New Year celebration at the Chapel Car Performing Arts Center, as well as uh, a, a dance troupe there. So uh, we hope you all participate. Um, Community Corner, we have a couple of birthday announcements to um, to announce. The first is happy 8th birthday to Georgie Rosen. Happy 10th birthday to Darren Post. Happy birthday to Easton Kaplow. And a very happy birthday to Vicki Langbergstrom. So um, thank you. We uh, Your names will also be in the supervisor's report tomorrow. Um, and we, the community, would like to wish you a very happy birthday. Again, if anyone has anything they would like to announce, a community announcement, please email it to communitycorner at mynewcastle.org. Um, all right, so now we're going to just open the uh, microphone for any public comment or new business not related to the public hearing for this evening. Anything new? Okay, is there anyone online? Okay, I'm going to take that as a no. Um, earlier this evening, by the way, we had a work session um, and our state senator, Pete Harkham, uh, arrived via Zoom. So if anyone's interested in what we discussed, I urge you to watch the, um, the YouTube replay of that. All right, so we are now going to open our public hearing on the right guest house at Chapel Hill Cross. So we're going to have presentations, I believe, by the... By the uh, applicant by Toll Brothers and I think Summit Greenfield, as well as uh, Gray Williams is here from the Historical Society to talk about it. So can I just give a... There should be a motion to open the public hearing. Okay, so first can I have a motion to open the public hearing? I move to open the public hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, so do you want to give a... I can uh, just uh, give a brief summary as to uh, how we got here. Uh, the, the, the public hearing um, um, relates to the application to uh, take down the guest house. That came into the town by letter last year, uh, April 21. It was part of a, uh, um, really a, a four-part request. The guest house was one of those requests. The town board had work sessions on June 7th, June 28th, June 26th. 
I'm sorry, July 26th, um, where it talked about the guest house aspect of the application. At the July 26th work session, you asked the applicant to provide some more information, which it did by letter dated October uh, 12th. Uh, all of those materials were posted to the town website, including the original application materials. Uh, on October 18th, the town board adopted a resolution declaring its intent to be lead agency under SECRA. Uh, the proposed action, again, the get relating to the guest house, was referred to the Westchester County Planning Department. Um, we did receive back a letter from the Planning Department, so that's also um, online and uh, in the packet tonight. Uh, in December, the board circulated a um, notice of intent, and earlier this month scheduled a public hearing, which brings us to tonight. Okay, perfect. And I, I just wanted to highlight, so for those of you who may not know, so the guest house, if you drive into the Chappaqua Crossing site from 117, it's immediately to your right, that White House. And currently, it is proposed to be utilized as part of the, the Toll Brothers development um, as part of, I guess, a recreational facility that they were going to build. Um, they have now um, you know, asked us to relieve them from that. So that's, that's where we are today. But um, I think there was just a little confusion we saw online. It was never going to be just a standalone house that was sitting there. Right now, it is contemplated as part of the site plan um, in the Toll Brothers development. So um, they have uh, asked us not to have to maintain that at this point. Um, and that is the subject of this public hearing today. Um, so I think, why don't we start by hearing from um, the applicant uh, as, to, as to what your want is. And then, then uh, Gray will hear from you. All right, well, thank you. Um, so my name is Diana Kolev. I'm from the firm of Del Bello, Donnell, and Weingarten, Wise, and Whitaker. And so I'm here tonight on behalf of CLS Chapel Yeah. Right. Okay. So uh, CLS Chapel owner, which is um, the um, successor to the master developer of the of this mixed use project known as Chappaqua Crossing, um, and also with the consent of KL Toll Fort, which is the related company of Toll Brothers that's now developing the East Village uh, residential component of Chappaqua Crossing. So tonight um, you'll see you have Felix Charney and David Walsh here as well from CLS. Um, there's also David Ball, an architect. Uh, from the Monroe Partnership, um, as well as Jason Godley, uh, the Senior Project Manager for Toll Brothers. Um, so thank you for putting that up. Um, so as you mentioned earlier, uh, the and I know it's hard to see over here, um, but um, the guest house is right here, which is, this is where it currently exists, next to this amenity center over here. Um, so, as you know, Chappaqua Crossing has been under development for many years. We've been uh, before your board and the planning board uh, numerous times to amend the secret findings and um, the associated plans. And so this is the, the, the right guest house that's, that was originally part of the Reader's Digest headquarters. The preservation of that guest house has been the, the preference in the past. However, the guest house is located, as you mentioned, right in the middle of a resident amenity space for the new 91 townhome luxury community that is currently under construction. And the constraints and costs of the preservation and, and adaptive reuse of the existing guest house have become a real issue. So as you mentioned, um, we did make a submission to a request that you eliminate the condition or the planning board eliminate the condition that required the preservation of the guest house and um, corresponding amendments to the secret findings. So in, in lieu of the adaptive reuse of the guest house, what the applicant is proposing is to construct a new clubhouse building that emulates the exterior design characteristics of the guest house. Um, if you could just go forward two, two slides. Um, what, one more. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Um, so it would emulate the exterior design characteristics of the guest house, and the new clubhouse would deliver essentially an identical facade um, to maintain the historic look of the guest house, but would better meet the needs and um, the desires of the new East Village residents at a more appropriate cost. 
So um, there would be no change to the existing building footprint or limits of disturbance. It would really just go in the same spot as the existing guest house. Um, and as Mr. Uh, Ball, our architect, will explain, preservation of the guest house is, you know, as, as it had been previously <coughs> discussed, is really a very un expensive undertaking um, that in this instance does not really make sense. It's located on a private property and it will not be open to the public. Um, we're really only talking about the facade um, that is visible. Um, the foundation is likely to become unstable and the numerous renovated additions and um, renovations to the guest house over the years um, have really greatly diminished its historic value. Um, but as we submitted in our materials, any interior items that are deemed historic, such as floors and moldings, can be removed and salvaged um, to be used elsewhere or in the, in the new building that will be constructed. Um, you'll also hear uh, from uh, Jason Gottlieb, who will explain um, that the existing guest house is really going to be more of a burdensome maintenance issue for the homeowners association that is going to um, take take over this project once once it's completed. Um, and it, you know, the heating and cooling and other maintenance costs of a renovated or repurposed guest house uh, is really going to be at a minimum 25% more as compared to a new structure. So, um, and as, uh, as your um, attorney pointed out, the town board has reestablished its lead agency status. Um, so what we ask from the board tonight is um, to, once you've heard from everyone tonight, if you um, are, you would consider closing the public hearing um, and considering the requested amendments. So I'm gonna just turn it over to, to Mr. Ball over here. Good evening, everyone. It's been a while since I've been in front of this board. Um, so I'm David Ball, uh, principal of the Monroe Partnership. We're an architecture firm that's been involved with this overall project for many years. Uh, last September, I was asked to look at the guest house, look at the historic um, importance of it, and also what kind of condition it's in. And, you know, the basic conclusion is that originally it was a very nice farmhouse. <coughs> probably built in the mid 1800s, late 1800s. And I, in my report, I kind of mentioned it was uh, probably late Georgian style, but it's kind of a simplified version of that. So if the original Reader's Digest building is a good example of Georgian, this is sort of a, a toned down version of it. Um, it. We did look and it is not on the National Register of Historic uh, Places. Um, and unfortunately, over the years, with various renovations and additions, it has kind of lost its original presence and quality architecturally. So um, if you could go, please, a couple slides. Uh, one more right there. So at the, the top photograph um, is basically the original building. With that said, on the right side, um, the porch that you see with very tall um, columns, we don't think is original. That was probably built in the 1960s, and Dave Walsh will talk a little bit about that afterwards. Um, and then also the, the windows, which is a little bit tough to see in the photograph, but those are the original windows, likely. They're single pane windows and they're covered with storm windows, which sort of diminishes their character. And, and by the way, that would be a necessary thing moving forward to have those. Um, the roof elements, um, right now the roof is in decent shape, but it's uh, an asphalt roof, which is unlikely the original roof. It probably would have been either slate or um, wood shaped shingles. Um, and also on the roof, would, and if maybe go one more slide, please. I, I'm sorry. So that this slide is a close-up of the columns in that porch addition at the south end of the building that's more or less facing the entryway of the overall uh, site. Those, those clearly are not original. And so that's why we came to that conclusion. Next slide, please. So there's been several additions. Um, on the top slide, you see what I'll describe as a carriage house that was likely built in the 1960s. Um, also on the bottom is uh, 
they built sort of a, a meeting area with a, a commercial kitchen. What you see in the middle is the commercial kitchen. To the right is uh, the, the meeting room. Next slide, please. Uh, these a couple more slides of, you know, again, the, on the bottom, on the right side is the carriage house, on the left side is the meeting room and commercial kitchen. And so, and, and there's a couple other details, like, for example, up on the roof, there is a uh, mechanical screen, which is obviously not um, original equipment. There's a couple flat roof dormers on the top of the building, the original house, which is unusual. Could be the original, it's hard to say. It's, it's unusual for that architectural style, but let's say it was there as part of perhaps a farmhouse. Uh, but really what, I think the main point is all these additions over the years also, um, on the next slide there, I'll go ahead to the next slide. Um, one more if you don't mind. Keep going. And keep going. I, I, there's more than I thought. Um, and Dave, I'll, I could talk about this, but afterwards, because there's a couple of slides of the interior afterwards. So, sure. um, but these are a couple of slides of work that was done in the mid 80s. And basically, and you go one more slide, please. You can see that they replaced all the siding, a lot, of, they clearly repaired quite a bit of the trim. And, and not to say they didn't do a good job and they didn't maintain, you know, the character of, of what was there originally. But the combination of, you know, all these additions, all these kind of 1960s add-ons, such as the porch, has really diminished the character of the building. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and again, another renovation picture. And then the next slide. So on the interior of the building, a little bit tough to see. Actually, the bottom left picture you can see the uh, on the right side of that, that's the uh, original staircase. Great old staircase, but the paint is really in the worst condition I've ever seen paint. It is really peeled, it's sticking out, you know, an inch or so out of the wall everywhere. And the concern is that that's probably lead paint. So to bring that back to life would be a real, you know, it'd be a very expensive proposition. Um, and you know, the floors of the building are in very good shape, but the, um, you know, like I said, the, the, and by the way, the molding is nice, but that's also covered with lead paint and it's not in great shape. <clears throat> so we're looking at, you know, how do you, what was originally a farmhouse, relatively small building, small rooms, you know, for example, on the upper pictures, they kind of combined what probably was a living room in a dining room and they added a new opening. And and it and so really talking, Jason will talk a bit about the viability of the use, but ultimately trying to take what was a house, relatively small house, low ceilings, and turn it into sort of a high-end community center would be a challenge. So um, I, I spoke a bit about the lead paint. That clearly is an issue. Um, secondly, in the basement, there's asbestos on the pipes, and that's going to be very expensive to remove that. Um, <clears throat> also, the upper floor, which really, the, the ceilings are low, which is a challenge for the new use, but the, um, there's no way of using the upper floor for handicap accessibility, so that's going to be a challenge. Um, and turning this from a residential building into a commercial building creates a number of issues. One is, even if you to reuse just one wall, the in commercial architecture, the new energy code requires a couple things. One of which is con continuous insulation. So back in the day, you'd build studs, you put, actually, it would be plywood or um, other, you know, board sheathing, which is probably what this home is made out of. Nowadays, you're required to add um, insulation with plywood on the outside, and that's what you put uh, the siding onto. And so effectively, you have to take down the wall, except for the studs, take down the windows, and rebuild the wall. So. 
reusing this as a commercial building for the exterior walls would be a challenge. Uh, the windows being single pane do not meet the energy code also. So that would be a challenge as far as if, if you brought in new windows, which could look very much like the old ones, that would meet the code. But if, if you use the existing <laughs> ones, you'd have to put storm windows on the outside, same condition that the building's in now, that it would diminish the look of the, the windows. There's also uh, mold in the basement that would be, have to be remediated. And then lastly, structurally, the existing foundation wall is stone rubble with mortar. It's got a number of challenges. Um, there's several areas where they've sent pipes through the wall to, to the additions, and that was done in such a way that it's structurally unstable. There's questions about, you know, if you're building a new building these days, you have to put reinforcement bar in the walls. And that creates, there's lateral loads from wind and earthquakes, and that's what stops that from, you know, those walls from, uh, you know, falling apart. And the, um, the stone wall, in order to make this a commercial building, you'd really probably have to put concrete on the inside with rebar, which would be pro prohibitively expensive to do. And also, the now you're creating new floor loads on the existing floor. So in commercial space, it's, you know, it's basically how much weight you're putting on the floor. That would end up being um, a much higher load. So you'd have to add structure underneath, more beams, more columns, and that would be, you know, fairly expensive to do. So the combination, and also the columns are rusting at the bottom, they'd probably have to be replaced. So you're talking about asbestos, lead paint, redoing the structure, energy code issues, all these things to make this existing house built in the 1850s viable as a commercial use is really a challenge. And beyond that, and Jason can talk about that a little bit, is that the, the house as it stands is really not appropriate for what they're doing. They're low ceilings, small rooms, makes it very difficult for them to work with. So that's basically, in a nutshell, um, our analysis of, of the existing building and how to use it moving forward. So Dave Walsh. Yeah. Hi, my name is David Walsh. I've been on board with Summit Development since about 2004. Prior to 2004, I was Director of Corporate Facilities for the Reader's Digest Association. And one of my specific responsibilities was the guest house and the operations. Um, over those years, you know, there was many things that happened up there. People who have memories of the, of the guest house was mostly through the parties that they had thrown up there. So there's only a real small handful of people who ever got to have a party up there. And I'm glad to say that I was certainly one of them. As we were preparing for this meeting, you know, I, I, I called an, an old colleague uh, who began his career at the Reader's Digest in 1962. If we can go forward one screen, please. Uh, back. Uh, back. I'm sorry, back. Back. Right there. So I, I contacted this old colleague, and he told me where I might be able to find some information in an archive room that is in the lower level of the Digest. Uh, sure enough, there was an old folder in a file room that had a handful of these Polaroids, which I copied and <coughs> sent out you know, today to our team so they can look at them. What he had indicated to me, and you know, again, he was there in, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. I believe he uh, left, I think, at about 2001. Uh, he indicated to me that there was significant renovations in the 60s, 70s, and this last large one, like being in 1987, and that he recalls that the porch was built uh, in the 60s, and then in the 70s, the other additions were added on to, and then in the 80s, they basically re you know, did the entire facade of the building uh, and you know, renovated it from there. Um, if you can move forward a couple of slides, I think what's important to note is, is right in here, when you look at the basement here, you can see, you know, over the years, and, and certainly that those pipes and the, the asbestos on those are pre-70s, so that all of that work was done back probably in the 60s. 
um, because they were all asbestos covered. But the way that things were just haphazardly knocked through the stone wall, to Dave's point, uh, you know, structurally certainly weakened the structure. And I think that's really important for everybody to kind of see and how this would be adaptively reused and how, how problematic that really is in terms, you know, for, for Toll Brothers and the luxury community that they're building. I also think that, you know, when you look at these, the, the, the existing structure, you know, converting it now into a commercial use for, uh, you know, a community center or whatever they're else they're going to be using it for, when you look at these low ceiling heights and so on and so forth, it's just, it, it just doesn't really fit for what they're, what ultimately a commercial building should be. But I just wanted to add those couple of things that I had in, in, in how we came across these new pictures uh, that haven't been seen before because they've been stuck in the in, in the archive room down uh, at Chappaqua Crossing, you know, formerly the Reader's Digest Association. So that's, that's it for now. Turn over to Jason. Hi, good evening. Uh, Jason Gottlieb, Senior Project Manager with Toll Brothers. Um, so, you know, from Toll's perspective, um, there's kind of three key aspects to this. One, one is, you know, we broke ground on the project about a year ago or so. We have um, a little north of a dozen units under contract at this point. Our model building is nearly complete. If you've driven through the complex, <clears throat> we just recently landscaped that and we'll be uh, anticipated opening, uh, you know, the model homes will be open uh, sometime next month. So a lot of our, our buyer demographic is downsizing from, you know, four or five, 6,000 square foot homes that they've had to maintain to this luxury townhome development. Um, and one of those draws is the kind of low maintenance uh, or lack of maintenance as part of uh, these communities, right? No snow removal, no landscape removal. Um, and we create these associations. Uh, toll is on the board and can at you, some point- um, Sorry, people can't hear you. Can you maybe move the microphone a little closer? Can you hear me better now? Yes. Can everyone hear better? Yes. Okay. So um, as part of these associations that we set up for these townhome communities, you know, Toll creates these boards and then we transition the boards over to the homeowners association, which is made up of uh, residents within the, within the community. And, you know, based on the, the feedback that we've been getting from our buyers, you know, to take on a, um, an existing structure like this that requires a great deal of rehab and um, is not really in keeping with a luxury townhome development. Um, you know, it's just something that would be a burdensome to the association. Um, so that's that's one of the components to uh, to this discussion. The other aspect here is that we've made commitments to the Attorney General's office as part of our offering plan to our buyers, um, which one has certain time constraints in terms of developing this clubhouse structure and two, in terms of the programming of what that structure is going to include. So, you know, an, an older structure like this, David um, spoke about the floor heights, the constraint of some of the spaces. I think there's a picture up of the stairwell, which is incredibly narrow. You know, that's not generally, uh, or not generally, it's not something that's in keeping with, uh, with an amenity structure for a project that we've built. Um, so I think those are kind of the, the key aspects from 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 our our seat. I think I yeah. So I'm just gonna you'd be surprised if I didn't want to add something, right? I mean, I didn't drive down from Connecticut just to sit here, and some of you I don't even know. So for, for good to your good fortune, you haven't had to deal with me since 2004. I'm Felix Charney. I'm the principal of Summit Development, who purchased this from Reader's Digest in 2004, and as Lisa can tell you. I am like a sore that just will never go away. It doesn't matter what you put on it, it's still here. However, I'm a person who keeps his promises. And I think Lisa, who at one point was a, a wonderfully lovely foe, would now tell you that I've been an honorable partner in the development and the adaptive reuse of the Reader's Digest project. It's been a very painful uh, time-consuming and expensive process that we've all gone through together. But as Tom was saying, who was here a little bit earlier, and he was taking credit for the perfection of the toll site plan, I will tell you that the toll site plan was kind of an afterthought. All, our, all of our energies were focused really on the retail and getting Whole Foods in town and making that work, and everything else kind of followed after that. 
Um, ironically, it isn't bad, but not everything was hyper-analyzed. And as we've been here since 2004, we've learned different things. And I have really actually come back very few times to ask for modifications to the original 159 conditions that were put upon me in, in 2015 and subsequently in 2018. And my position is there are certain things that we did and we did right, and there are certain things we did that we did with good intentions, and there are certain things that we did where we maybe went too far. But at the end of the day, it kind of all works, and it all works, and it works as a result of all of our hard work. We were asked from the very beginning of this project, and we didn't have to be asked, that the cupola, which is an iconic feature in the county of Westchester, was something that needed to be saved. Little known fact, that's where Whole Foods was first going. They were doing an adaptive reuse of the cupola building because they thought it was cool. And I knew it was my responsibility to maintain that. At that time, and up until this whole issue with the guest house evolved, there was really no other feature on that property that we were told that we really needed to, to, to cherish. And so we always had, politely, a different opinion of the value of the guest house. And David articulated the five additions. I got to go to one of those parties. It's probably because I paid Reader's Digest all the money I did all those years ago. They invited me to it. It's a building that once may have been something, but through all the years, it became something else. And I think what we're trying to do today, or when the condition was placed upon us, is to take that round peg and fit it into a square hole. I don't know if people on this board or members of this, uh, in this town hall are going to be toll residents, but people are moving there to, for a quality of life, to stay in a community they love and embrace, to have a non-maintenance lifestyle. And unfortunately, the condition that's been placed upon us to preserve a small portion of this building I think politely is a bit of an overreach. And we're smarter, we're wiser, and we're suggesting that there's a whole host of reasons why there's a better way. We will give you what you asked for. It will look the same, but it won't fall down. And it will be functionally correct. So I've come back for the few couple of times and I've said, hey, I don't think we thought this through as clearly as we should. And I'm asking you guys to think about that again. And I know many of you who've gone through the building and may or may not agree with me that it isn't exactly as special as maybe a home that deserves to be preserved. So with respect to our friends in his historic, we don't think it's a house that ultimately deserves the level of attention in it that's being put upon us. And we're asking you to look at it slightly differently with the knowledge that we've all gained through all of these years uh, and find a better way. Just as we have recently changed all of the ways we live by all the lessons that we've recently learned. That's my request. And I think Lisa, I'm pretty sure, I don't wanna be held to this. This may be the last time you get to mess with me. Why? Because I'm leaving or you're leaving? Oh, well, <laughs> well, if you're leaving, I'm hoping that I'm leaving. I'm tired. When we started this project, I used to finally tell people that I'm not old enough to qualify to live in the 55 and over community that we were proposing that Janet Wells suggested we build. I'm not old enough to live in that community. I may come back and ask you guys to do assisted living because I'm, I am old enough and now qualified to live in that. But on a serious note, uh, nice to meet the new folks, and thank, thank you, you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else for the this side of the issue? <laughs> um, I have one quick question. Uh, I'm not sure who to address it to, and I know it's late in the process, and I will preface it with the fact that I have not actually thought this through, but I like to just kind of noodle on things. If a decision was made that we wanted to keep the guest house as it is. Is there a way that either it could somehow be taken out of, Ed's going to kill me for asking this, but I'm asking anyway. Is there a way that it could either be somehow be taken out uh, and deeded over to the town or the historical society or something like that and find another place to put that clubhouse 
Is that even a remote possibility? So rather than basically readapt it, is basically just to take it and give so, it away. So I think Toll would be thrilled to be able to replicate the building in its current place and build a proper contemporary functional clubhouse that, to meet the needs of its new residents. If the town wants to take the, what's left of that building and move it somewhere, God bless you. Uh, you might want to take it over to some of those lots I gave you on Roaring Brook Road that I gave you all a long time ago, and you haven't figured out what to do with them. But if the only thing that would work is you need to go up there. You need to call the guys from Nantucket to move houses and just to haul it down the road if you want to do that. I don't want to go through any process that's a change to the site plan, not to mention that Jason, he now, uh, he now answers to a higher level because he's got an AG uh, filed plan with those guys that would probably require an amendment. But... You know, if you, I, I, over the objection of Jason, if you want to take the house and move it and we replace it as discussed in the exact same footprint, that might work. But I'm sure Ed is rolling his eyes at the 474 permutations that would be required. That's what I like about you, Alicia. You're just like me. You think, you think and, outside the box. Okay. Um, all right. That was, uh, does anyone have questions for the applicant while we're here before we move over to Greg? All right, so great. Yeah, coming. Okay, well, for little me, <laughs> we have to move this down. This. Can you help him with that? It should be some kind of help. Can you do it? Uh, uh, we'll, we'll let the experts move. Let's move it down a little further. Okay. So I don't ping. Okay. There we go. All right, that's good. And let's see how to. There you go. All right, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Is this really directional now? Can everybody hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay. Um, Gray Williams. I'm speaking mainly of the, um, as, uh, as town historian. Um, I live at 376 Quaker Road, uh, and I have been a Newcastle resident off and on since 1937. Um, I wrote a, lo a longer form, but it's getting late, so I'm going to shorten it. But it is important for you to know that this is not a new issue. Uh, I'm going to send you by email my long form, which I hope you'll look at. And I've already sent you a history of the building and a description of its main historic features. But I do need, for this hearing, to summarize what what, how far back this issue goes. In 2009, Felix Charney of Summit Green, Greenfield declined to consent to landmark designation, but promised to preserve both the guest house and the headquarters building. The headquarters building has indeed been preserved and successfully adapted for reuse. But the part of the property intended for residential development, including the house, was sold to Toll Brothers. And in 2019, Toll Brothers applied for permission to demolish the building and erect a clubhouse in its place. The planning board rejected this request. Toll Brothers then proposed to remove the entire interior of the house, which the firm was legally entitled to do. Planning board granted this request with conditions to protect the exterior during the process. Meeting these conditions promised to be exorbitantly expensive, so Toll Brothers withdrew the proposal. The firm's architectural consultant provided a plan for adaptive reuse of the building that required minimal alteration of either the exterior or interior. I was under the impression, perhaps mistaken, that Toll Brothers had accepted this plan up until late 2021. In any event, April 20, 
two, Toll brothers again requested permission to demolish the house, and this time has offered to erect a replica in, a, in its place, and here we are. Okay. Uh, most of what I'm basing my analysis on is in, the, in letters and uh, exhibits of October 9th, there are a couple of more things that have come up since, which I'll try to get to as well. First of all, the proposal supposes that the reproduction would be an acceptable substitute for the real thing. But of course, it just would not be any more than a piece of reproduction furniture would be an acceptable substitute for a genuine antique or a studio copy for an original work of art. An authentic historic building would be replaced by the equivalent of a stage set. On this, the historic preservation community is unanimous. Some people are feel more, even more strongly about it than I do. But that, that is basic. The replica idea just doesn't fly. Likewise, the Toll Brothers offer to include salvaged boards and other remnants of the building in the facsimile, and that is not an acceptable alternative to preserving the building itself. In its most recent letter to the town, Toll Brothers utilizes a report which has been summarized this evening uh, to defend its proposal for demolition. The report commences by pointing out that the building is not on the National Register of Historic Places. Of course not. The owners wouldn't consent. Otherwise, the house would be a Newcastle landmark and virtually certain for inclusion in the state and national registers as well. Since I wrote that, I just found out that, in fact, it has been declared eligible uh, by the state uh, Department of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation. Once it's eligible, it means that if an application is presented in proper order and the owner's consent, it'll go on. Uh, it has been declared. This goes uh, most recently in 2020. There was a letter of resolution signed by Mr. Charney uh, that stipulates that the headquarters building and this house are to be preserved. Um, and um, there is really no question of its historic importance. And uh, we would have no trouble getting it on the National Register, and I think it would easily qualify. The report goes on to argue that the exterior has lost so many of its original Georgian-style elements that it's no longer authentic. But the house is not Georgian and never was. It's a fine example of vernacular federal architecture of the first half of the 19th century. And its spare decoration is in keeping with the Quaker traditions of the community. The report then argues that the house has undergone so many alterations over the years that it is no longer historic. This judgment is completely contrary to the accepted standards for historic significance. All old buildings have necessarily undergone changes over the years, but the alterations to this house haven't compromised its essential integrity. A major reason why this building is so important is that it has changed so much less than others of its age, including several of our recognized landmarks. The most significant alteration was the addition of the pillared front porch. And I think the evidence is quite plain. It was constructed by the Lawrence family about 1928, uh, presumably to increase its prominence at the entrance of a new village they hoped to establish there. The porch is old enough to be considered historic in itself. And contrary to the report, its slender columns are in keeping with the federal style of the house. 
Finally, the architect report maintains that since the foundation of the building is a mortared stone rather than concrete reinforced by st steel rebar, it is structurally unsound and in danger of collapse. But virtually all residential buildings up to the early, early 20th century have such foundations, and they pose no such threat. There are 53 landmark buildings in Newcastle, and all but a few have mortared stone foundations. More than half of those, 29, are as old or older than this house, and they're not collapsing. However, this is a very serious issue. At the very least, the town building inspector should be asked to report on the condition of the foundation. It would be even more desirable, and there's precedent for this, that an engineering firm agreeable to both the town and Toll Brothers evaluate the foundation and to specify what measures might be needed to protect it. Perhaps most important, the report echoes the Toll Brothers' claim that the preservation and maintenance of the building would cause an exceptional, unacceptable hardship to the future owners of the residential development. This claim should not be accepted without verifiable evidence. Precisely how much more would it cost to adapt the building rather than demolish and build a new one in its place? Precisely how much more would it cost to operate the adapted building rather than a new one? And precisely how much of a burden would each owner of the 91 projected units of luxury housing have to bear? Would that burden really amount to severe hardship? The preamble of the town historic preservation reads as follows. It's hereby declared as a matter of public policy that the protection, enhancement, and perpetuation of historic properties is necessary to promote the economic, cultural, educational, and general welfare of the public. That's the real issue here. The right house is a, is a demonstrably historic building. It would unquestionably be designated a Newcastle landmark if its owners would consent. It's important for several reasons. The first and foremost is its rarity. Houses of this age and in such good condition are uncommon, and those that survive deserve preservation for that reason alone. Almost as, imp as important is the quality of its architecture, the federal style, with its emphasis upon simplicity, symmetry, and graceful proportion, has long been popular in this country. It's the chief inspiration for what we call the colonial style, which is still widely favored. This house is a particularly fine and re representative example. In terms of local history, the site commemorates two prominent early families in Newcastle, the Fowlers and the Wrights. The heritage of the Wrights is particularly significant because their properties remain undivided for so long. They were large enough to provide the sites of both the Reader's Digest and the Horace Greeley High School. In more recent times, the house reflects Lila Atchison Wallace's devotion to American history and the arts. And finally, the house has long been a handsome and highly visible feature of the community, and its loss would be sorely felt. I therefore urge the town board not to overrule the resolution of the planning board or its own resolution, but to confirm it and to adhere to the principles of our historic preservation law. I also urge Toll Brothers to accept the feasible plan for adaptive reuse of the building. And that was my prepared statement. There are a few things that have come up this evening. First of all, it was pointed out that it's not, it would not be, a, it's going to be on private property. I would say a good three-fourths of our landmarks are on private property. That is an irrelevant issue completely. Uh, roofs have to be replaced. The fact that it's not the original shapes, again, is irrelevant. It would not be considered a, uh, something that you would hold against the property as being historic. Uh, the little dormers on top 
were added by the Reader's Digest. But of course, the Reader's Digest history up until 73 would be considered historic too. In fact, as I have just found out that the, um, uh, the Reader's Digest site, the whole thing, is, is, has been accepted for eligibility as a historic district by the state. Uh, now they're going over this question of the, of the house. But there's no question that what was done by the digest is, is part of the history of this. It's relevant. Uh, most of the additions that they've pointed out in the slides are going to be removed anyway. They're not part of the house at all. The only main addition is the front pillars, and the evidence on, from old maps and so forth is cl clear that they were uh, that front porch was put on in 1928, and the Lawrences had it. Uh, I've been around long enough to remember it from my childhood. Those pillars had been there; they weren't added late, later on by the digest. Uh, lead paint is an issue, but again, I think you have to know precisely how much it, it will take to remove it. Uh, it, it. They describe this as a commercial building, but that, as I understand it, is not what this building is going to be. And the requirements for a store or a real commercial building would be rather different. I, I don't know how they arrive at that dis distinction. Finally, Lisa, I'm sorry, but you can't just move the building. <laughs> Uh, a, it's, it would be impractical, and that destroys a good half, if not two-thirds, of its historic value. Yeah, I wasn't actually talking about moving the building. I was talking about just segregating that oh. building from the area and just taking well, I, it. Ideally, that should have happened originally. Yes, that. Yeah. Uh, if, <laughs> if this property had been carved out, Indeed, it probably could have been, without any difficulty, if it found a customer to make use of it as, as an office building or as a, some sort of center, uh, that whole corner used for com commercial purposes. It could have been a restaurant, it could be offices there, and any, I can imagine any number. But once it became part of this uh, residential development, that, uh, that became impossible. I feel sympathetic to a certain extent with Toll Brothers. I know they don't like this building. They don't want to use it. They, what would, it would suit their needs better uh, to, to build something to their own desires. But the public interest has to be considered here. And that, I'm, and that I put forward is what really matters here. Okay, that's it. I'd welcome questions. Any questions for Gray? Well, that was very thorough. So, and I, and I read, say, yeah, I read I've sent you some documents. documents. I'll send you some more. Um, so I, I appreciate all the information that you've sent us. I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand. I, I, I said that I've read all of your submissions, and it, it's been very thorough. So um, I don't have any questions at this time, but I know where to reach you. Yeah. So I will certainly um, go over everything again. All right. Okay. Thank you. I'll leave it to the next. So um, I yes. just have one comment. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Hey there. <laughs> um, in terms of, you know, I, I, we certainly agree that in 2009, our partnership declined to register the guest house or any part of the property of, the, of, of, of Chappaqua Crossing. But it's also important to note that, at least in my tenure there at Reader's Digest, when I worked for Reader's Digest, they were approached twice to landmark um, the main cupola building and the guest house, and they declined. They declined many times over their 70-year tenure there to landmark anything on that property. I don't think that that should make us any different than any other private property owner, just because we declined to have something registered. There's a lot of historical homes that are not on the National Registry because they don't want to register them on that registry. So I just think that that's important to note that Reader's Digest declined it many times before. We declined it once. If I may, there, uh, there's no question that the Reader's Digest and commercial owners of property tend to resist being uh, 
on the National Register because they feel that it will affect their plans to do something else for the property. That's not the point here. The point is that a promise was made to preserve these buildings, and it, and it was kept, in the case of the Kivula building, admirably, but not this house. It got overlooked. All right, thank you. Um, before we open this up for public comment, because we want to hear from everyone here, um, I just want to note that we did receive a number of written comments. Those are in the uh, public record. And uh, no one on this board has made a decision in our minds about what's going to happen here. So certainly any uh, comments you have are going to be well taken by, uh, by the board. So with that being said, I'd like to open it up to public comments. Come on up, give us your um, name and address when you come up, please. Any comments? <clears throat> Maybe I can tilt this up and do you hear me enough? Or I should go higher. You can take it out too. We'll, we'll just take turns between tall and less tall. You can take it out of the stand as well. Okay. You hear me good now? Um, Bill Spade, architect, uh, live on Provost Road here in Chappaqua, um, have done projects on historic homes. You're even aware of a project we're trying to complete now on uh, King Street. <clears throat> that uh, project's being done by a not-for-profit organization who has struggled with affording to recreate the Quaker Meeting House that was there. And we've worked with Gray uh, on how to do that adaptive restoration of that and think it's come out very successfully in terms of the both the exterior appearance as well as what we've been able to do in the inside. We've retained that structure and we restored the exterior to as much as possible mimic <clears throat> the original building. That's a not-for-profit that's able to accomplish that. Here, I hear a for-profit company complaining about the cost to do this restoration. If I may say, um, their chairman uh, in December was touting uh, their record profits by Toll Brothers. Um, and uh, if I'm reading correctly, uh, it was somewhere in the neighborhood of $1.3 billion that was their net income for 2022. I think it's the full year number. <clears throat> they also touts that they have gross margins of 25% or more on their net sa on their sales. So if we take those numbers and apply it to Chapel Claw Crossing, there are 91 units. I see one listed for $1.24 million. So I think you do that math, that comes out to about $113 million that they'll earn in sales income if they're Profit mar if their gross margin is 25%, that comes out to about $28 million that they'll earn from selling those units. So to hear that the cost of restoring this building or adaptively reusing it is a problem for them, I think that's disingenuous. I really think that that's, uh, you know, given that the likelihood is they're going to make $28 million on <clears throat> selling these units. So, uh, you know, if this is at all a consideration. I certainly would ask them, ask you to ask them for detailed cost information so you can see what the, uh, the actual dollar values are that, that they're considering and compare that to the profitability of selling the 91 units. Uh, I'd also add that uh, uh, making this building adapt uh, adaptable for ADA purposes, ADA recognizes that there are historic buildings that have challenges for making them accessible. So it, its standard for accessibility in historic buildings is to the greatest degree possible. So it doesn't expect that you can come to a point where you say, well, we have to tear the building down in order to make it a, a, accessible for uh, users. It's what's the greatest degree possible that you can create. So certainly there are uh, abilities to create that accessibility to this building even to the degree to the second floor, I've done lifts and elevators and all kinds of uh, devices and buildings to create accessibility uh, to second floors and 
a, a lift might cost about $75,000. So yes, that's not cheap, but uh, in the scheme of the cost of the project and the profitability of this, it certainly seems like that's not a, a big number. So I certainly uh, believe that this building is the, you're, it's able to be made accessible, it's able to be made adaptable to their use, and that's the commitment they made. Lastly, I'd say they refer to their attorney general filing. I've been involved in attorney general filings. Presumably that filing identified that they were required to adaptively reuse this building because that's the contract, that's the requirement. It would obviously be a little, I don't know uh, what the word would be, but uh, certainly hopefully they didn't represent that the building could uh, you know, could be you know, redone or somehow, you know, not be this uh, adaptive reuse that was part of the requirements. So, um, anyhow, that would be my comments at the moment. Thank you. Right, thank you. So, if I could just correct a statement, um, I'm not the chairman of Toll Brothers. So, I didn't make, I didn't make $1.3 billion dollars last year. Had I did, I promise you I wouldn't be here tonight. The responsibility financially for the adaptive reuse of the building is mine. Uh, that those dollars have been had had to be set aside by virtue of trying to conform to this condition as my obligation was to each of the entities that I've sold off on this property that as the master developer we had to honor all those commitments and pay for all of those things all of those roads that you see out there we paid for those that was our obligation we're still fixing at the railroad crossing our obligation so Although my wife particularly would be pleased to know that I made $1.3 billion, mm -hmm. it's my problem. So I've been arguing relative to the cost. Toll's concern is functionality. And my wife is the chairman of the Nantucket Historic District Commission. I do not come to you without any kind of favoritism toward historics. Our position at the risk of repeating ourselves if what's left of the historic integrity of this asset nowhere near compares to the historic integrity of the cupola, which we did everything under God's green earth to preserve and have done so successfully. And I stand before you with the project that we've built together to say it is a really good collaborative effort. I think you maybe went a touch too far in terms of the conditions that have been placed upon us to keep this building, yet it's got a functional life ahead of it as part of an HOA for a high-end luxury townhome project where only the first floor can be used. And that's what we've been arguing. We're just arguing we think that there may be a better way. So, it's my money. All right, anyone else? Hi. My name is Janie Allen. I am a former- You can take that out if you don't want to bend. What? You can take the microphone oh, out if you don't want to bend. Okay. Yeah. My name is Janie Allen. I'm a former editor at Reader's Digest, and uh, Eleanor Griffith has written some public co some comments that she would like me to read to you tonight. If I may, she is. We, we, she emailed those. We have those as well. Yeah. I'll just briefly. Okay. Just uh, part of them. Uh, I, mainly, I want to uh, I want to say that I want to talk about the the need for a exhibit of some sort for the DeWitt Wallace, DeWitt Wallace and his wife, Lila Bell, who did so much for this community. And we feel like the guest house would be an ideal location for such an exhibit, in the, even if only in part of the house, even if only in a room or whatever. But it would be, uh, well, long overdue. Um, I say this, I'm, I can tell you a little bit about our background, Eleanor and I were part of four, a group of four editors and a local resident of Chappaqua, Laura Anderson. Um, the fourth member was Laura Kelly, uh, who put together a, an ex exhibit um, in 2010 as the digest was moving out of the building here, before, just before it moved out. And it was called RD, Reader's Digest, the local magazine that conquered the world. This was the only tribute to DeWitt and Lila Wallace uh, that, uh, and, their RD, and their Reader's Digest legacy. 
unfortunately, it only ran for a year in the Chappaqua, in the, New, uh, sorry, the Newcastle Historical Society, and um, then we took it down. And during that year, we got a lot of visitors to there, and there were several articles in the New York Times, and one of them uh, called Recalling the Glory Days of the Reader's Digest spoke about the exhibit, quote, by the 1940s, well, this is not the quote about the exhibit, but, but they said, by the 1940s, only one publication exceeded Reader's Digest in sales. It was the Bible. So this is all to say that it was an impressive history. This, com this company had an impressive history worldwide. And uh, she makes several proposals, which I agree with, and several of us here do. Uh, number one, Save the Reader's Digest guest house. It's a historic building that it is. Not all historic buildings are architectural jewels. For certainly, if you've ever been to Elvis Presley's birth house in Tupelo, Mississippi, you could say that. You'd know that. It's just a shack. But here we have a really, truly historic building, and it's on the Digest property to have... Uh, to make it an historic landmark, to honor the Wallaces in the Digest would seem to be an obvious thing to do. But then to follow up with that with uh, working collectively to design a permanent mini exhibit area in Chappaqua, perhaps at the guest house, that would be my choice, uh, or at the Newcastle Historical Society, at the library or the town hall, telling the incredible story of the Digest um, and, and the guest house. Um, especially. Also, there were presidents dined there, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> that head of Outward Bound once uh, dined there with Dwight Wallace and left with a check for a million dollars. There were so many dignitaries, so many celebrities who came through there, and there's so much, and he had so much impact worldwide. The whole world came calling to the door, you know, Dwight Wallace when he was alive. Um, the Wallaces have been called the preeminent publishers of the 20th century, with, once upon a time, 100 million readers plus worldwide. In fact, time is running out now. We need to work together to preserve their legacy permanently in Chappaqua. And one fine day, hopefully, to cut some ribbons, serve up some lemonade, and share this incredible legacy with thousands of school kids, locals, and foreign visitors. That's, uh, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other public comments here in the audience? I guess I'll pick this up, or maybe I'm appropriately sized here. Can you hear me? <laughs> My name is Jody Rolana. I live in Terrytown. Um, but I'm the current executive editor at Reader's Digest magazine. Um, I worked in the building here for 10 years. Um, before that, I was an intern. Um, I have a really long history of working for Reader's Digest. And um, although I was not here when um, the company relocated, um, I'm here now. And um, I can speak to our current legacy, um, which is we, we turned 100 years old in, 1920, uh, in 2022. Um, so celebrating 100 years and currently still have over 13 million readers. There's a significant number of people both here in the States and around the world to whom this brand, this magazine is still beloved. Um, we have a presence beyond the magazine and I'm not here to you know, uh, just talk up the company, but just to say that if we were able to come up with a plan to save the guest house, to come up with a plan perhaps to house um, some archival material, a tribute to the Wallaces who did so much for this company, this county, um, this country, um, that I, I can assure you there would be people who would still be interested in coming from far and wide to celebrate what Reader's Digest is today in addition to what it has been for 100 years and will continue to be going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a brief aside. The town doesn't own the, the guest house, so while I love the ideas of uh, an exhibit to Reader's Digest, and I actually also worked at Reader's Digest, um, 
we can't mandate that it happen at the guest house because we don't own that. Um, but it is something that as a town, we can try to think of if there's a place we would want to put that and house that. Yes, and I, I totally understand that and didn't express that fully. But when you do talk about the opportunity to do something there or elsewhere, I completely concur with that and, and can speak as the current um, custodian of, our, of the archives of Reader's Digest and the need for a good home for them. Okay. So I'm happy to talk at any point about that further. Thanks. Thank you. I just want to clarify, because um, there seems to be just a little bit of confusion about the guest house. So to, to expand on Lisa's point, right now it's it's on private property, right? So it I think what's up for debate is whether it's preserved by the developer or whether they tear it down and replicate it, right? I think those are kind of the two choices that we're faced to ponder here. That's It's this or that. So I just wanted to clarify that for anyone who's confused about turning it into something else. Right now it's on private property. All right, any other comments here? Come on up. Okay. Good evening, everybody. I'm <coughs> Raimo Moisa, and I'm originally from Finland, so excuse my English. And uh, where, where do you live now? Uh, North Salem. Okay. And I work for Reader's Digest some 40 years. I'm former editor-in-chief of international editions. I worked in the U.S. since 93. And I can tell you guys, especially for brothers and friends, that I've been living in guest house in weeks, months. Mm -hmm. I've been drinking more than was suitable, so much that I got to even even the um, security to stop it. I was alone in the guest house. They had a some wire cabinet there. <laughs> Bad things happen when you are wrong. <coughs> so and while while I have lots of experience about guest house, so I have some experience also renovations. I. Uh, I have a great respect to Toll Brothers and their quality and all that. And I didn't have any idea what restoration of 1730 house means that was collapsing. And <clears throat> somehow I was able to do it. I was able to do it past the historical committees, past the inspectors and everything. And just, I'm still standing here and I have a car and I'm still married and <laughs> as I checked today so in a bank account there's a few thousand dollars so I'm <coughs> really surprised that for such a fantastic corporation like Toll Brothers it is such a huge thing to put this place into reasonable condition and knowing a little bit about <coughs> life of on the one percenters so most of then fancy places have also guest houses where when the visitors come for Thanksgiving, you can re reserve that room in the guest house and you put your guests there. So you don't have to mess them with at home, right? So, <clears throat> so I would imagine that what is the price tag if you say that we have a room that President Reagan stayed. So how much would you pay extra for enjoying that? And only way to do it is not to do a replica, but renovate it, restore the old place into what it used to be, and use it as, as guest house. Lots of drinks, lots of good parties, and lots of visitors who stay there. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Uh, is there anyone on uh, the Zoom who has a comment? No hands are raised. Okay. John. Mm. 
we, we have a lot. Can you say uh, your name? I'm sorry. Uh, my name is uh, John Herlick. I live at One Apple Tree Close. The one of the four remaining houses that Mr. Lawrence used to sell all of his other houses when, when he moved in. There's, it's a wonderful area. It's a wonderful place to be. Um, and um, thanks to um, to, uh, to to the Mr. Lawrence, and thank you, of course, first to the Review Digest groups. With whom I had many discussions about their decision to move to uh, the Stupid Park Avenue. Um, the former Indian building, they decided uh, there was an editor there that decided that she did not want to uh, remain in this town. Uh, so we lost a wonderful, wonderful corporate neighbor. But just to, just to put this aside, living in one of the uh, uh, Lawrence's uh, early houses with the 1928 pedigree, pet, pet, though there's some arguments to whether it was 1930, I know the fact, and we just did this, we took we, the uh, insulation out that shouldn't have been there. Um, we made a lot of the repairs that that is being mentioned. Wasn't all that unreasonable to do. We were we were glad to be able to do it. Um, the there were other guest houses along Roaring Brook Road. Uh, there is a, uh, a, a guest a guest. I won't mention the name of the, the current tenant, but they. Retained it and done it. Um, the, the favorite guest houses. One of the things that uh, they did a lot. Of, it was a lot of entertaining, and the Wallaces were also responsible for a wonderful, wonderful uh, vestige, which the town does now own, which is uh, the Performing Arts Center, the Chappaqua Performing Arts Center, which was their former auditorium and where they used to have a lot of. Um, discussions and changes and uh, get get the whole crew cast and crew together and we're trying to modify that now to to uh, make more casts and changes and uh, and to and enjoy it to retain a historic property in a place like this makes a lot of sense maybe one of the solutions we can come up with is some kind of a not-for-profit uh, adjunct to it where people would contribute to do some of these things. Uh, we don't want you to get stuck with a large bill that you weren't counting on. And I do want to say this, that uh, the current owner of the guest house uh, has been enormously amenable to following protocols and changing things. Uh, to our benefit, and we're very grateful. But maybe there's a way we can somehow um, mitigate some of the economic uh, costs and structures. That's all. Uh, but I just wanted to say that I thank you to the thank you to the Lawrences, thank you uh, to the former generations which made this whole thing possible. And thank you for building a, a, a town here in this town and not in Pleasantville, as they uh, would like the rest of the world to believe. But yes, right here in Chapel. Thank you. Thanks, John. All right, any other comments? <clears throat> sure. Do you mind if I, I want to follow up on something Felix had said? Um, you know, Felix pointed out that, that he's got the obligation for doing these repairs. And it strikes me that that's a transaction that he and Toll Brothers have done. Um, the, it, it seems you know, hard to understand that uh, the company that's due to make maybe $30 million on this development has offloaded the obligation to Felix to do this renovation, even though it's part of that arrangement. I would say certainly that arrangement between Toll Brothers and Felix ought to then be revisited because if they didn't leave enough money in that deal to do the repairs that were part of the obligation, 
that shouldn't be on you all to then change the arrangement. That's a deal between those two parties. And they would need to restructure that. If the cost is more than Felix can uh, bear, certainly Toll Brothers earning all of that profit uh, can, can bear that cost. So I would implore you not to be drawn in by that argument that he doesn't have enough money to do the proper repairs. Um, also, by the way, they've mentioned um, cost of doing asbestos removal, cost of replacing windows, cost of doing lead paint um, mitigation. Those would have, the lead paint and asbestos would still have to be done if they're demolishing the building. You can't just demolish a building and throw away asbestos and throw away lead in the garbage. You would have to still do the same mitigations. The windows, they have to put new windows in the new building, same as they would have to put new windows in the old building. So some of these costs that they've been identified as sort of exorbitant costs to do the adaptive reuse, they would have to bear those costs anyhow with demolishing the building and, and building a new one. So the structure, they'd have to build a new structure, a foundation support for a new building. So uh, many of those costs are are, are, are end up going to be comparable uh, whether you're building a new building or working with an existing building. So thank you for clarifying. Thank you. All right. Any other comments? Hi, how are you? I just wanted to reiterate um, our request previously that if it seems like there's been an opportunity to make public comment that you would that you would close the public hearing tonight um, and, um, and con sorry close the public hearing tonight and uh, to consider the amendments that we have excuse me requested thank you okay thank you yes great respectfully please do not close the public hearing you have a lot on your plate that to think carefully about they mentioned, you mentioned you do the, there are two alternatives. There are, in fact, three. One is to preserve the building. Another is to tear it down and create a re replica. That alternative is so unacceptable, is so wrong, that speaking for myself as a historian, I'd rather that you revoke the original resolution allow them to tear the building down and put up the building they want, but not to pretend that it's anything like a historical building. Okay? Thank you. All right. So, um, and just to confirm, nobody online has their hand raised, correct? No hands are raised. Okay. So um, we have heard a lot. I think a lot of people have shown up tonight. Thank you for coming. I know it's late. Um, I would like the board, I think, to entertain a motion. We are not meeting again as a board until uh, February 7th, I believe, because next week is the fifth Tuesday in a month, and we give ourselves a break every once in a while. So we're not meeting till the 7th. So I would propose closing the public hearing, but leaving it open for written comments so we can still receive all those written comments for like another till maybe February 1st. Um, no, that's not enough time. Hold on, I don't have a calendar in front of me. Uh, for 10 days. Sir? Seven, eight, nine, ten, till February third, which is a Friday, till uh, five p.m. on February third. Um, at which point, then we can read through all of that. You know, if we receive any additional written comments, I don't know that anyone else is going to show up in person, but we absolutely want to hear from written comments. So uh, I would entertain that motion. At which point, you know, on the seventh, we will get together as a board and, and discuss those. Um, what we've received and, and our thoughts about the matter. So, can I have a motion? A motion to keep written said. comment <laughs> until open until February third. I know. I, I can. Can we have a discussion about sure. it? Um, 
I think that in light of the fact that we have a number of people here, a lot of people, um, I'm not so sure that, and having been on the town board for one year, I'm not sure what has been traditionally done, but I would think that if there's a number of people, that we would keep it open until perhaps we see that there are less less people who come in. I've, I've heard that done before. So um, I would be inclined to leave it open. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think it would hurt the matter. And um, then the written period would be the 10 days rather than a lengthy a lengthier written. So period. we can do so, that. You know, in my experience, we've done that where there have been so many people who have been here to talk that we have not been able to actually get to everybody. Here, right. everyone had the opportunity to speak. I, I'm happy to continue to keep this open right now if anyone has anything else to say. Um, but I don't know that keeping it open for public comment here is going to elicit more people who are not here today who want to speak, is my thought that if... Right, I, I don't think we do know. That we would just keep it open for written comments. People have 10 days to write to the board. Yes, that's correct. Um, I I mean, there are four, four of us here, so I would defer to the rest of the board, but I, I would personally keep it open um, until, until we see that there are no further comments in person. Are there any further comments? I mean, at, at a different no, time. Is, I don't know. is there any urgency? I mean, I think that the, the developer does need to know what they're doing. Um, there are site, their, their work permits open. They, I think they need to know one way or the other. Are they keeping it, are they keeping it and adaptively reusing it? Or are they tearing it down? I think they do need to, to know that to move forward. Would we be effectively talking about an additional week if we wait until our meeting? No, because we couldn't have another hearing until the 7th. Right. And then we would keep it open for another week or so for written comments. So it's it's effectively... Okay, so it, it's probably the, the like time two for weeks. written comments can't go with, can't overlap and be closed... All at once, is that right? It could I be. guess we could. Do we have a meeting the week of uh, February 20th? No, no, it's no. not a spring. No, no, I'm no. looking no. ahead in terms no, of just the oh, you so look in No, we have a meeting March 13th, I mean February 13th. We do not have a meeting President's Week, which means we wouldn't then meet again as a board until February 28th. Um, if if I, if I may, um, as Jason had pointed out, um, it's not just about knowing what they're doing. They are under a time uh, crunch here because they are in the middle of construction and it, they do, you know, they need to be able to move forward also because of the Attorney General's office um, review of this. So, so there really is a timing issue here. I mean, the way I consider is if we should leave a, a public hearing open also is are there going to be new facts presented to us by anyone else that would kind of sway or, or inform our decision Possibly. one way or the other? Possibly. So, I didn't want to bring this all up, but at this time, the State Historic Preservation Officer uh, representative technical is reviewing this proposal. I think you should not make a decision or shut the hearing until you have that information. I don't know how quickly they can do that. Well, and what are they reviewing it for? Or I guess a recommendation, but then, I don't know, for some reason they do have to sign off on this. I, I'm a little fuzzy about the law, but they, there's this resolution of 2020, which is quite plain. But meanwhile, this new proposal has been made, and, they want, and they're going to weigh in on it. And I think you should at least wait until that happens. And I don't know how long it can take, although I can check. But if you leave, leave the hearing open, then I'm sure they can make it. And do you know what this is? Well, as it was mentioned earlier, that uh, the property has been listed as eligible. And um, I expected SHPO as the um, State Preservation Office to yes. weigh in with a written comment at some point. Yes. Um, and we haven't received that yet. But no. I, I, whether we hold it open for written comments or whether we um, just hold, resume on the 
seventh, uh, it would be time enough, I think, to receive that written comment. I don't think anyone's expecting a representative to come no, in person. It'll be a written comment. Here. And their comment's going to say, we want, we think this is eligible to be a, a land. It's eligible, and we do, we do not approve of this um, proposal. Right. But if even if it is eligible, the owner still has to consent, correct? Quite. But the, real, but the question of um, historical significance is very much affected by this. It's something you need to take into consideration. So, okay. Can I just... I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just, I just, I just want to clarify that you know, yes, we made the submission um, to to the to Shippo. Um, they are reviewing it, um, and what they would do is, uh, you know, I think as one of those situations of what comes first, you could make, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you could make the secret determination that you need to make as a board. Um, it would not uh, go to the planning board yet at that point, and so Shippo can at any point during that process be negotiating with with us regarding how they want to proceed um, in terms of any um, salvaging or anything like that that might need to happen from, or documentation that might need to happen uh, from the house. So so I, I don't think there's anything that's prohibiting you from making your um, secret determination at this point. Yes. <clears throat> I guess I would, I wish Jill were here. Um, We've had some experience with the state agencies. You know, Jill's online. Jill, how long have we been waiting for a CO on the intersection at, at 117? Yeah. Uh, no. With the DOT. Uh, let, let's not compare New York State DOT to anybody. Yeah. Let's, let's be fair. They're, they're not the same entity. It's, it's the state, isn't it? So <clears throat> I think that politely you have the intellectual and the power to make a determination whether or not our request is reasonable or unreasonable. And we have, if anyone's been up on the site recently, you'll notice that this structure is in the middle of a tremendous amount of construction. And Toll typically wants to finish the clubhouse first, but because of some of the issues that we've addressed this evening, they've waited. But at some point, they need to address that, and it's at the front of the site. So we're looking for a resolution. Uh, I think you have the information to make a decision. You know how we feel. You certainly know how Mr. Williams feels. And I'm not so sure what else could come in that would otherwise persuade you one way or the other. So um, I just want to uh, answer to that, Felix, because I, I hear you. Um, it's not a matter of us making an intellectual decision. We certainly have a lot of information, but it's a matter of our obligation as an elected board to give the public the opportunity to speak. And so that's the only issue that I'm considering at this time. I, I, uh, it's not, as, it's not a, a consideration that addresses the substance. It's about process and our role um, regarding the community. Sure. So uh, that, uh, that's very different from what you're saying. I'm not, Which I understand. I'm not quarreling with public's opportunity right. to speak, but that was advertised for this evening or whatever else you wanted to do. Right, so but that's, that's the issue with uh, closing a decision to close a public comment. Right. So that, that's what we're looking at, which I know is not within your purview, but I appreciate your, your perspective. Okay, well, have you ever met a developer who wasn't in a rush? <laughs> I have not. So at least I'm consistent. <laughs> you are. I understand. Yeah. Um, all right, what, what are your thoughts? I, I feel that people had the opportunity to come tonight and share their comments. I'm fine with keeping written, accepting written comment until the third. Um, I don't particularly see a need to keep this open for public comment, though. Holly? Um, We're split. I know that they're in a rush, um, and I know that the community has a lot of feelings on this, but I think knowing that public can submit written comments um, for at least 10 days, I think I'm okay if we close it. Okay. So, you know, I definitely hear what you're saying. I, I think that... I don't know that we're going to get any additional information. I think even if we work under the assumption, which I think is a valid assumption that, that SHPO is going to say this should be preserved, I think we can take that into account. But I would certainly make sure we contact them um, and let them know that we would like to hear from them within 10 days. Um, 
they, I think they should be able to get that information to us. Um, so can I entertain a motion then to close the public hearing but leave it open for public comments for 10 days written until comments. written comments uh, until 5 p.m. on February 3rd? A motion to keep written comment open on this issue until 5 p.m. on February 3rd but close the opportunity for public comment. Right, and adjourn. And adjourn. Uh, can I have a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Uh, nay. That would be nay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate everyone for coming out and for staying so late. See you next year. All right, so uh, next on our agenda are just the resolutions. Um, if anyone has them in front of them, it's really not too many of them. It's a consent agenda and two resolutions. Um, do I have to read all of them? All of them? I can. I don't mind. All right. Does she have to read it's all fine, the consent it. agenda items, or can she just no, say no, as listed in the consent agenda? Listed. Yeah. I move to adopt the consent agenda as submitted um, consisting of the following items listed in our resolutions. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, yeah. um, I move to approve payment of claims in the amount of $339,907.64. 2022 expenditures totaling $244,425.63 and 2023 expenditures totaling $95,482.01 listed on the summary pre-check writing report and detailed voucher detail reports all dated January 23rd, 2023. Checks will be issued and mailed to each claimant listed on Wednesday, January 25th, 2023. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I move to authorize the hiring of Linda Lewis for the position of recreation attendant 0270-05 within the recreation and parks department as a driver for seniors at the hourly rate of $18 per hour effective January 3rd, 2023. Uh, I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I move. I move to authorize the hiring of Dylan Rockstall to the position of recreation attendant 0270-05 within the recreation and parks department to work with the basketball and flag football programs at the hourly rate of $20 per hour effective January 25th, 2023. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, can I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Motion to adjourn the meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, thank you, everybody.